1978, the landscape of horror changed forever with the release of John Carpenter's Halloween. Jumping off from a very simple premise, Carpenter crafted a vision of terror unlike anything that had been seen before. Though there were movies not unlike it prior to its release, Halloween's success would inspire a brand new subgenre, the slasher film. And while there have been many imitations, not to mention sequels and remakes, few horror movies have achieved the kind of glowing praise and reverence that the original Halloween has. Not to mention the fact that it introduced us to one of the most famous screen villains of all time, Michael Myers, the unstoppable killer without a conscience. The fact that this hugely successful thriller was made by a group of 20-something newcomers to the business further underlines how much of a once-in-a-lifetime sensation it was. So how did the boogeyman come to life? Well, grab some candy, or a knife, whatever's closest, because we're going to tell you what the f*** happened to John Carpenter's Halloween. Hey, jerk! Speed kills! Though Halloween is indeed the brainchild of John Carpenter and his co-writer slash producer, Deborah Hill, the project didn't actually originate with them. The man we have to thank for setting things in motion is actually Erwin Yablons, then an independent producer and co-founder of Compass International Pictures. Erwin had seen Carpenter's hard-boiled siege flick, Assault on Precinct 13, and was impressed by the filmmaking on display, even agreeing to help distribute it. Furthermore, he decided he wanted to be in the John Carpenter business and pitched the director an idea that had been floating around in his head about a psychopath who stalks a group of babysitters. Carpenter was just about finished shooting the TV movie Someone's Watching Me and had no plans after that. So he said, why not? The simple title for the project was The Babysitter Murders. Although in recent years, Yablons has disputed that that was ever going to be the actual title. But the producer eventually had one more notion, one that would change the movie's entire atmosphere. He was shocked to learn that hardly any horror movies up to that point had actually taken place during Halloween, supposedly the scariest night of the year. He was further surprised to find that the title Halloween had never been used. He said to Carpenter, Why don't we set it on Halloween night? In fact, why don't we just call it Halloween? The rest is history. Both Carpenter and Yablons were in agreement that the film should be suspenseful, but not gory. Yablons was particularly inspired by old horror programs that he would listen to on the radio as a kid, which in his mind were so scary because they played out vividly in your imagination, as opposed to showing you everything. He wanted the audience to be frightened, not repulsed. Carpenter had a few stipulations. He wanted to be paid $10,000 to write, direct, and compose the music. He wanted Final Cut, and he wanted his name above the title. While the latter was an unusual request for a relatively new director, Yablons told him that if he could make the film for $300,000, he could have anything he wanted. Carpenter brought aboard his then-girlfriend Deborah Hill, who he'd met during the making of Precinct 13, to be his co-writer and producer. Hill was integral to the formation of the screenplay. It was her responsibility to make the teenage girls at the center of the action sound authentic. Totally. Carpenter, on the other hand, focused on the grimmer aspects of the plot, using the idea of an unstoppable evil as the hook. Carpenter had also been inspired by Michael Crichton's Westworld, specifically the villainous robot played by Yul Brenner, who simply cannot be stopped no matter how many times he's shot or burned. This vision helped shape, pun intended, what would become the film's antagonist, Michael Myers. Carpenter and Hill cranked out the script in two to three weeks, and with the help of financier Mustafa Akkad, the film was greenlit with the $300,000 budget. However, they had a tight schedule to work with. It was already spring of 1978, and the idea was to get the film into theaters by Halloween, naturally. The production had approximately 20 days total to shoot, and they relied heavily on friends and local students to help out. In their late 20s at the time, Carpenter and Hill were just about the oldest people on the crew. Pasadena, California was going to stand in for any town USA. 
And one of the main challenges for Carpenter and company was cropping out the palm trees, which would certainly look out of place in the Midwest. Another challenge that would be harder to overcome was the lush greenery of the surroundings. Since this was springtime in California, not autumn in Illinois, the popular story is that the production would use the same bags of leaves over and over, sprinkling them on the streets and sidewalks right before the shooting commenced, then gathering them up for the next shot. They would call the town Haddonfield, named after the town in New Jersey where Deborah grew up. In the matter of casting, Carpenter needed three wholesome American girls to play babysitters. He'd zeroed in on Anne Lockhart for the central role of Laurie Strode, but was persuaded by Deborah Hill to cast Jamie Lee Curtis instead. Curtis was, of course, Hollywood royalty, being the daughter of Tony Curtis and Janet Lee. But at the time, she had only been in a handful of television shows, far from an above-the-title name. But Hill saw the potential in her backstory. Here was the daughter of Psycho's Marion Crane, starring in a horror movie about a maniac with a knife. The headlines would write themselves. Casting Annie was fairly easy. Nancy Loomis was the wife of Carpenter's colleague Tommy Lee Wallace, and had a supporting role in Assault on Precinct 13. She was even a member of the costume department. For the role of the vapid Linda, Carpenter intentionally wrote it with PJ Souls in mind. Since she'd played a similar part in Brian De Palma's Carrie, Souls landed the gig and only later discovered that Carpenter wrote it for her specifically. To play Linda's boyfriend Bob, Carpenter asked Souls' then husband Dennis Quaid, but he wasn't available to do it, so John Michael Graham was chosen instead. To portray the very formidable character, often known as The Shape, Carpenter called upon his friend Nick Castle, who one day had idly asked the director if there was anything he could do to help. Carpenter essentially said, Yes, you can be the killer. Carpenter gave Castle no direction other than, Just walk. But the actor did eventually add one of Meyer's signature moments, when he looks upon his victim like a curious dog would a treat. For his work, Castle was paid just $25 a day. The final piece in the puzzle was the small but crucial role of Dr. Sam Loomis, Michael's psychiatrist and eventual hunter. Carpenter knew he needed a name for this part, someone recognizable who could give Loomis the gravitas needed to sell the idea that his former patient is the walking embodiment of evil. Carpenter first went to Peter Cushing, the legendary British thespian known best for his work in Hammer horror movies playing Van Helsing and Dr. Frankenstein. But Cushing had just made Star Wars, the biggest movie of all time, and had no time for Halloween and its small salary. Carpenter then looked towards Cushing's longtime collaborator, Christopher Lee, but Lee turned them down flat. Deborah Hill would later say that she bumped into Lee at a convention years later where he confessed that turning down Halloween was the biggest mistake of his career. Uh, if that's true, we'd argue that The Howling 2, Your Sister is a Werewolf is a close second. Erwinia Blonde suggested Donald Pleasance, who'd made an impression playing villains in You Only Live Twice, and in particular the Charlton Heston Western Will Penny. But he'd also played heroes in films like The Great Escape, so he could lend Halloween a character who seemed believably intense and ready for action. Pleasance was offered $20,000 for five days of work. But the story goes that he really took the part because his daughter had been a big fan of Assault on Precinct 13 and encouraged him to do it. Pleasance and Carpenter didn't always get along, with the former often pushing the director's buttons. In one instance, Pleasance flat out refused to say Carpenter's dialogue. When Loomis calls Haddonfield to warn them that Michael is coming, right before he finds the abandoned truck, he was also meant to call his wife at home and reassure her he's okay. But Pleasance rejected that idea, insisting Loomis should have no personal life or past. Carpenter, too insecure to contradict the veteran actor, agreed with him and cut the dialogue. Though Pleasance's salary was considerable, a more significant amount of money was going to another key player in the film, the camera. Carpenter knew the film would have to look great in order to make up for the low budget, so he decided to use the Panaglide camera rig to give it a professional, sleek look. More commonly known as a Steadicam, 
The Panaglide enabled the camera department to move freely for long, unbroken takes. And it was much easier than using a dolly with its cumbersome tracks. Halloween would use the Panaglide to great effect throughout, but its biggest contribution came during the terrific opening sequence of the film, which looks like one unbroken take of our villain preparing to kill, but it's actually two separate takes because they could only shoot for about four minutes at a time. But the effect is still brilliant. Incidentally, that sequence was the last to be filmed during principal photography because the house itself had to be dressed and painted to look like a normal suburban home. It was chosen because the filmmakers had found it in a state of disrepair. The scene where we meet Lori and she approaches the house is what it actually looked like. Perfect for the film's needs of displaying the Myers house as completely dilapidated. So when it came time to shoot the scene where a young Michael stalks his sister, the team had to spliff it up to look like a normal home. Hence, waiting until the very end of the shoot to film that critical sequence. One aspect of the film that you likely already know is the legend of the mask itself. Described in the script as being made of rubber and having the grotesque features of a man, there was plenty of leeway in terms of what it could actually look like. It was up to Tommy Lee Wallace, the film's production designer and eventual editor, to find the perfect one. Wallace received two masks from a magic shop on Hollywood Boulevard, a sad clown mask and a Captain Kirk mask. The clown mask spoke for itself, but Wallace had to modify the Kirk mask a bit. He shaved the eyebrows and sideburns, cut the eye holes wider, spray painted it white, and dyed the hair darker. Once everyone saw the mask, they flipped for it. One of Carpenter's inspirations for such a blank palette was the thriller Eyes Without a Face, which definitely has one of the creepiest masks in history. Carpenter would later say that despite the low budget, the shoot was a relatively easy one, but there was still much to do in the short time that they had until its release, presumably in October. The score would turn out to be incredibly important to the film, and while the story goes that Carpenter knocked it out in just three days, Deborah Hill is on record saying he already had the theme in his mind much earlier on during the writing process. Apparently, Carpenter would play the ominous theme for Hill while they were working to help inspire them. The music is credited to the Bowling Green Philharmonic Orchestra, a shout out to Bowling Green, Kentucky, where he grew up. When Halloween was completed, Erwin Yablons held a screening for all of the major studios in the hopes of getting one of them interested in distributing it. Problem was, none of the studios showed up. Yablons was going to fall back on his past as a marketer and distributor and get the film in theaters himself. His first stop would be Kansas City, Missouri, where the film performed admirably, allowing him to take it elsewhere. Fortunately for Yablons, his business partner Joe Wolf had a relationship with MGM Studios, who was willing to make around 400 prints of Halloween, allowing the distributors to start getting a little wider with their little movie. Initially, the reviews were not kind, with most critics dismissing the film as artless and shallow. But soon the tide began to turn, First, a glowing review from the New York Village Voice, then a couple from famed Chicago critics Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, the latter of whom compared it to, you guessed it, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Soon enough, critics who waved the movie away at first began to reevaluate Halloween, happily coinciding with the movie taking off at theaters and racking up big returns. Ultimately, Halloween ended its theatrical run with over $70 million worldwide making it the most successful independent feature of all time at that point. Of course, you know the rest. Halloween spawned a plethora of imitators, and the early 80s saw a horror boom unlike any that had come before. Naturally, the massive success of Halloween necessitated a sequel be made. Carpenter and Hill begrudgingly wrote it after realizing that it would be made with or without them, also letting the substantial paycheck help convince them. Carpenter is on record saying Budweiser got him through the writing of that script, as they struggled to find reasons to justify its existence. With the completion of David Gordon Green's recent Halloween trilogy, there are currently 13 movies in the franchise. Though, of course, making sense of the timeline can be a little tricky. What's obvious is, there's money to be made off that blank-faced, unkillable monster. And when a new Halloween film is inevitably announced, None of us should be surprised. 
after all. You can't kill the boogeyman. After Halloween was a huge hit, it was only a matter of time before another one was made. Even though he tried to pass on being involved, John Carpenter would end up being tasked with writing, producing, and even directing some scenes during reshoots. What ends up becoming Halloween 2 would actually cause problems with the series for its entire run. Just about every contrived plot point in the series can be drawn back to this movie. Except for that whole, you know, Cult of Thorn thing. Which we will dig into in its own episode of what the f*** happened to this horror movie. While this movie does often get overlooked in the rankings of the series, it does offer some interesting things. But the road to get there was fraught with problems behind the camera. With Halloween 2018's reset, we are now seeing an alternate reality where Laurie Strode didn't go to the hospital and have to fight off Michael Myers once again. Could the entire series, up until the 2018 film, just be a fever dream of a young Laurie Strode while recuperating in the hospital? Her vivid imagination playing all sorts of tricks on her? Even reimagining it a couple of times? But for now, let's go back to Haddonfield Memorial Hospital and find out what the f*** happened to Halloween 2. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. In Halloween 2, we open with the events from the end of the first film. Michael has been shot six times and falls off the balcony only to disappear. Weirdly, in the original film, we hear six shots. While at the beginning of this film, we hear seven. Loomis, though, confirms he shot him six times, as told by his frantic interaction with the police. I shot him six times! 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 He has obviously lost it by this point. His calm demeanor has been thrown away, and he is in full-blown panic mode. As much credit as Donald Pleasance gets for his first portrayal as the good doctor in part one, his descent into a more frantic and exposed character in the sequel is impressive and should get more praise than it does. Meanwhile, Laurie is taken to Haddonfield Memorial Hospital. There we meet a colorful crew of hospital staff. Laurie is sedated and spends the rest of the film in a hazy dream state. While out walking around town feeling good about himself, Michael runs into a boy listening to a boombox that I totally wanted when I was a kid. Jealousy is not a good look for me. But Michael learns about Laurie's whereabouts during a news report on the radio and makes his way to the hospital to finally finish what he started. While out chasing down Michael, Dr. Loomis ends up at a grade school that had been broken into. There he finds the word Sam Hain written in blood on the chalkboard. He also mispronounces it as it should be Sawin. Sam Hain, it means the Lord of the Dead. But he's a bit preoccupied at the moment, so we'll give him a pass. It's also here that the nurse from the first movie shows up to drop an exposition bomb on the good doctor. It's here that we find out Laurie is actually adopted and is Michael's sister. With this, Loomis heads off to the hospital where he finds Michael has gone on another killing spree while Laurie has stumbled around all doped up and had flashes of the fact that she sort of knew she was Michael's sister all along. Everything culminates in an explosive finale that kills off both Loomis and Michael for good. And the confirmation needed is the flame shooting out of Michael's skull dead is dead. Well, it was supposed to be anyway, but we're about to see the 12th movie in the franchise hit theaters, so yeah. John Carpenter had no interest in returning to the Halloween franchise, but when someone suggested he should stay on as producer, he looked at it as a way to get some of the money he felt he was owed from the original movie while also helping a young filmmaker get started in the business as the first film had done for him. He was tasked with writing the film, and he really had no idea where to go he decided to set it on the same night as the first film. Start with the mystery of where Michael ended up after he fell off the balcony. After a while, he became stuck and didn't know how to proceed. One of the ideas was to set the film in a high-rise apartment building. Eventually, it was changed to the hospital setting. After NBC had picked up the broadcast rights for the first film, they had requested a few additional scenes to fill out the time slot. While thinking about what he could add, Carpenter claims that at two in the morning, Thanks to a six pack of beer, he came up with the idea that Laurie was Michael's sister. This lent to something motivating Michael in the second film, as well as gave Carpenter some fodder to use for the extra scenes for the original film. He says Vader's twist in The Empire Strikes Back influenced him to do this. Carpenter has said that was a horrible decision and has helped ruin the rest of the franchise. Who can argue with him? It has caused problems anytime a new movie has been made. 
When they were working on part four, they had to work around the fact that Jamie Lee Curtis wasn't going to return, so they gave her an off-screen death and an orphan daughter, or abandoned if you take into account that Laurie claimed to have faked her death in H2O. In part six, he is chasing down his possibly incestuously fathered baby. In H2O, he's back after his miraculously revived sister. In Resurrection, we find out his brother is Busta Rhymes. Okay, not really, but it'd still be better than what we got. This familia connection has plagued the series ever since Carpenter himself said, quote, the brother thing was awful, just awful. But here we are. With the script written, Carpenter then turned to Tommy Lee Wallace to direct the film. Wallace had been a production designer and editor on the first film. He was excited about it, as he had some ideas of his own for what a sequel should be. Once Carpenter handed him the script, his excitement fell. After the first film, the slasher boom had started to take effect. All of these films seemed to revel in the excitement of upping the blood and nudity to pull in audiences. To be fair, it worked. Wallace was hoping to keep the slow-moving, blood-free approach to the film like they used in the first one. He rejected the offer to direct, but would come back to direct Halloween 3. Where Halloween got it done with suggestion and shadows and true old-school suspense technique, somehow to me, Halloween 2 was summed up with that like hypodermic in the eyeball. With this, Carpenter had to find another director, and Rick Rosenthal was hired. One of the criticisms of this film is that Michael looks so different. There are varying stories as to why the mask itself looks different. Some say that Nick Castle would shove the mask in his pocket between takes on the original movie. This would have caused the white spray paint to begin to come off, revealing the flesh color underneath, giving it a weird yellow effect. Another story is that Deborah Hill had put the mask into a box and stored it under a bed after the first movie. She was an avid smoker, and the years of exposure to cigarette smoke yellowed it. On top of this, Dick Warlock was brought in to play the shape this time around, after scaring director Rick Rosenthal. Warlock saw the mask and put it on and then stood unmoving in Rosenthal's office. He didn't speak when asked who he was multiple times by the director. When he took off the mask, he asked if he could play the part, and the director hired him. While he had the attitude down, he was actually smaller in stature than Nick Castle. He wore lifts to try to make himself seem taller but the mask still didn't fit the same way it had on Castle. This led to the character appearing slightly off in this film. When Jamie Lee Curtis signed on to the movie, it was noted that she had cut her hair closer to the shorter hairstyle she has become famous for. She ended up having to wear a wig for the movie. In various shots, you can see that her hair seems to be different. While this normally could just be chalked up to it being a few years between films, this time it was because of the wig. Both Michael and Laurie seem off in this movie. Maybe this lends credence to my dream theory, Hashtag Laurie's Dream Theory. One piece of trivia you can use to impress your friends is that Jamie Lee Curtis has played Laurie Strode in six different decades. Halloween in 1978, Halloween 2 in 1981, Halloween H2O 20 years later in 1998, Halloween Resurrection in 2002, Halloween 2018, and Halloween Kills 2021. When Rick Rosenthal turned in his cut, John Carpenter was not impressed. On the other hand, I think Halloween 2 is, is an abomination and a horrible movie. I was really disappointed in it. Mm. And, but I don't think the director has gone on and done some other films. I think his career is launched now. But I don't think he had a feel for the material. Yeah. I think that's the problem. He didn't have a feeling for what was going on. He called it about as scary as an episode of Quincy M.E. Carpenter took to re-editing the film to up the tension and showcase more of the kills. He even went back and shot some new scenes and inserts to make the film even gorier than before. It's a good thing Tommy Lee Wallace decided to pass. With a higher body count, more blood, and some nudity, Carpenter felt it had a better shot at making money at the box office. Rosenthal was livid at this and has been very outspoken about it. He would get another shot at Michael Myers with Halloween Resurrection. It didn't help his case any. One thing Carpenter did leave in was Dana Carvey's excellent appearance as a new assistant. While it does have its fair share of detractors, the film does have some good points. Even though it moved away from the more subtle and blood-free storytelling, some of the kills in the film make it fun. The nurse getting scalded in the hot tub is gruesome and looks great. Apparently, she got an ear infection from the not-so-clean water. Gross. The scalpel in the back always makes my stomach drop, even if the lifting of the nurse in the air makes no sense. But the saddest death in the whole film has to be the young man that was mistaken for Michael Myers and rammed with a police car. Turns out, that is the boy that Laurie has a crush on, Ben Tramer. Man, she not only lost all of her friends, but also her hopeful future boyfriend. Laurie has had a rough life. No wonder she was an alcoholic in H2O. 
While Michael would go on to stalk more family members and other films, this was the one that gave us his connection to Laurie Strode. For better or worse, this entry would influence every Halloween film that came after it. Even if you're not a fan of the twist, you have to agree that this is all a dream in Laurie's head up until the 2018 reboot. I'm making this happen whether you like it or not. Hashtag Laurie's Dream Theory. You don't really know much about Halloween. He had no interest in compromising his script to appeal to the modern youth. Your father came into the hospital. I thought he was crazy, out of his mind. He's hanging onto a Halloween mask. And what he said was, they're going to kill us all. It's been reported that people walked out of Halloween 3 when they realized Michael Myers wasn't going to show up. You thought no further than the strange custom of having your children wear masks and go out begging for candy. For two films, moviegoers watch the mask slasher Michael Myers stalk Jamie Lee Curtis and murder his way through the small town of Haddonfield on Halloween night. So, you can understand that some were shocked when they went to see Halloween 3, and it wasn't anything like the previous two films. Instead of more Michael Myers, they got a movie about a warlock who wanted to use the power of Stonehenge to kill millions of children with masks that would melt their heads down into puddles of snakes and bugs. This change in direction did not go over well. For decades, Halloween 3 Season of the Witch was largely disregarded. And now, we're going to try to find out what the fuck happened to this horror movie. In 1976, producer Erwin Yablins of Compass International Pictures had an idea for a movie about a killer stalking babysitters. It could have been called The Babysitter Murders, but when Yoblins decided the story should take place on Halloween night, it became Halloween. Impressed by director John Carpenter's assault on Precinct 13, he hired Carpenter to write and direct the film. And Carpenter brought his girlfriend Deborah Hill onto the project to co-write and produce. When Halloween was released in 1978, it was a massive success. So, of course, Yoblins wanted a sequel. Carpenter and Hill were enthusiastic about making Halloween too but legal and financial circumstances basically pushed them into it. Then, legendary producer Dino De Laurentiis showed up with an offer. He wanted to produce Halloween 2 and offered Yablins a major payday to let him do so. Yablins took the deal and De Laurentiis gained the right to make Halloween 2, with an option to produce Halloween 3 as well. Released by Universal Pictures in 1981, Halloween 2 didn't make as much money as its predecessor did, but it was successful enough to open the door to a sequel and De Laurentiis decided to exercise his contractual right to produce Halloween 3. Carpenter and Hill were the first filmmakers approached about the project. Their hearts hadn't been in Halloween 2 to begin with. Carpenter had Rick Rosenthal direct it instead of taking the helm himself. And from the script up to the finished film, they weren't too happy with how it all turned out. So the last thing they wanted to do was make Halloween 3. They knew it was going to happen with or without them. So Cartman gave a response he thought would ensure that it would be made without them. He said we would only work on the film if it was something completely different. No mass slasher, no stalked babysitters. The only connection the film could have to the previous two was the Halloween setting. And to a surprise, De Laurentiis and Universal were completely fine with that approach. Carpenter and Hill were again hired to shepherd a new Halloween movie to the screen. Now they had to figure out just what this different idea would be. Hill had a simple pitch a movie that would show what happens when witchcraft meets the computer rage. Carpenter and Hill only decided to produce the sequel, so Piranha and the howling director Joe Dante was hired to direct. And since Carpenter and Dante were both fans of the British horror stories about Professor Quartermass, they brought in Quartermass creator Nigel Neal to write the script. Neal had total freedom to come up with any kind of story he wanted to, just as long as it was about witchcraft in the computer rage. While the script was in progress, Dante received a competitive offer. He was given the chance to contribute to Twilight Zone the movie alongside John Landis, Steven Spielberg and George Miller, and he took it. When Dante left Halloween 3 behind, Carpenter turned to an old friend, Tommy Lee Wallace. Carpenter and Wallace had known each other since grade school. When Carpenter got into filmmaking, Wallace was right there beside him. He helped out on the set of Dark Star, was art director and sound effects editor on Assault on Prison 13, production designer and editor on Halloween, and The Fog. He had been the first choice to direct Halloween 2, but left the project after reading the script. He had no interest in making a bloody body count movie. If Halloween 3 had been another Michael Myers movie, he still wouldn't have been interested. But as soon as Hill told him it would be something different, he signed on. 
and he had to start moving fast. He got the offer to direct in January. Filming was scheduled to begin in mid-April. The film had to be through post-production by mid-September to be ready for an October theatrical release. However, there was a speed bump on the way to production. When Neil turned in his script, the story and structure of Halloween 3 was in place. But the tone and the pace were off. There was a feeling that the 60-year-old screenwriter wasn't in tune with the horror audience of the 80s. The script was slow and dark with no room for jump scares or stylized murder scenes or moments of humour. The lead character was an alcoholic with a depressing home life, a toxic relationship with his wife, bratty kids, there were odd supernatural moments with no reasoning, and a lot of mean-spirited jokes at the expense of the Irish. When Carpenter and Wallace asked Neil to liven things up and make him more 80s, the writer walked. He had no interest in compromising his script to appeal to the modern youth, so Carpenter did his own rewrite on the script. And when Carpenter was finished, Wallace did a rewrite as well. Carpenter didn't want to take credit for his contributions. Wallace wanted credit for his. And Neil wanted his name taken off the movie entirely. So that's how Wallace ended up with the sole writing credit, even though 50 to 60% of Neil's script was still in place when filming began. The story begins with store owner Harry Grimbridge running for his life after visiting a Halloween mask factory. He's being pursued by well-dressed silent assassins. Characters Wallace added to the script. He calls them grey suits. After collapsing at a gas station, Grimbridge is taken to a hospital, where one of the doctors on staff is Dan Chalice, an alcohol-chugging ladies' man with an ex-wife and two kids he doesn't seem to see much of. While in the hospital, Grimbridge is killed by a grey suit, which then blows itself up in the hospital parking lot. Chalice is baffled by this turn of events, and intrigued when Grimbridge's daughter Ellie shows up looking for information on what happened. Ellie asks Chalice to help her investigate the mask factory. So, he ditches plans with his kids to go on an adventure with a woman young enough to be his daughter. And yes, they do end up in bed together after traveling to the small town of Santa Mira, which seems to be strictly controlled by Colonel Cochran, owner of the Silver Shamrock Mask Factory. Soon, Chalice and Ellie are able to confirm that something insidious is going on there. Cochran is planning to celebrate Halloween in the old-fashioned way, with human sacrifice. He has harnessed the supernatural powers of Stonehenge and somehow distilled it into computer chips, which he has hidden in the trademark badges on every one of his silver shamrock masks. TV commercials with a catchy jingle tell the children of America to tune in for a big giveaway on Halloween night. But when they do, the magical chips in their masks will be activated, and millions of children are going to die in horrific ways. To stop Cochrane, Chalice and Ellie will have to deal with the grey suits, which are actually robots created by the mask and toy maker, and hope they won't fall prey to his schemes themselves. Carpenter was dating future wife Adrian Barbeau by the time Halloween was released. Barbeau invited her friend Garn Stevens to a screening of the film, and Stevens brought her husband Tom Atkins. A few years later, Atkins and Stevens were both cast in Halloween 3. Atkins took on the role of Dan Chalice, while Stevens plays Marge Gutman, an ill-fated Santa Mira visitor. Wallace cast Stacey Nelkin as Ellie Grimbridge, with Al Berry as her short-lived father. Atkins' friend Ralph Strait plays store owner Buddy Kupfer, who gets killed alongside his wife and son, played by Jadine Barber and Brad Schachter. Jonathan Terry appears just long enough to lose his head as disgruntled Santa Mira resident Starker. Wendy Westberg as assistant coroner Teddy. Dick Warlock, who played Michael Myers in Halloween 2, is a prominent grey suit. And Wallace's then-wife Nancy Kyes Loomis, who had played a Michael Myers victim in the previous films, makes an appearance as Chalice's ex. The first person Wallace had in mind for the role of Colonel Cochran was Tonight Show host Johnny Carson. Ned Beatty was also on the list of possibilities. An offer was made to Fred McMurray of My Three Sons and the Absent-Minded Professor, but he never responded. It was Deborah Hill who suggested Irish actor Dan O'Hurley for the role, and O'Hurley went on to deliver an incredible performance on the level of a James Bond villain. Halloween 3 had a budget of 2.5 million, the same as Halloween 2. Only 25,000 of that went toward the special effects. Berman Studios had just four weeks to get those effects ready before filming. But it's interesting to see that the director who thought Halloween 2 was excessively violent brought a lot of violence into Halloween 3. Grimbridge's face-crushing death, Starker's decapitation, the destruction of the Kupfer family. None of those were in Neil's script. Carpenter and Wallace added those moments. The murder of Teddy wasn't even in the shooting script. Her scenes were additional photography, worked in when it was decided the movie needed another kill. But 
Wallace was comfortable with these moments of violence because he thought he could shoot them in a tasteful, artistic way, with as little gore as possible. Effects artist Tom Berman agreed with the approach. He told Fangoria magazine, This movie is really not out to disgust people. It's a fun movie with a lot of thrills in it, not a lot of random and gratuitous gore. That said, the deaths of Marge Gutman and the Kupfers are more disgusting than anything Michael Myers ever did. The pumpkin, witch and skull silver shamrock masks were supplied by Don Poe Studios, the mask company that had created the Captain Kirk mask that Wallace modified into the Michael Myers mask for the first film. To save costs, the filmmakers let Don Post retain the copyright to the masks, so he didn't charge the production for them, and even let them film the silver shamrock factory scenes inside his factory. Jim Leonard designed the pumpkin and witch masks. Pat Newman designed the skull mask, which Don Post Studios had actually already been selling since 1965. Trying to make the sense of the fact that this movie was called Halloween 3, Wallace referred to the silver shamrock masks as the Halloween 3. While the previous Halloween movies had been knife movies, Wallace saw his entry as a pod movie, just like one of his all-time favourites, the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. He even paid tribute to Body Snatchers by filming some scenes in the same location, Sierra Madre, and the town named Santa Mira was directly lifted from the earlier film. Wallace also wanted to make sure his movie had an ambiguous ending, which Body Snatchers almost had, until the studio made the director shoot an epilogue where it seems everything is going to be okay. Wallace thought Body Snatchers should have ended with Kevin McCarthy screaming, you're next, directly into the camera. Which is why Halloween 3 ends with Chalice screaming into the phone, trying to get Silver Shamrock commercials taken off the air, while left not knowing if he was fully successful or not. A test screening of Halloween 3 was held in Las Vegas, and the audience was not happy with the ending. Universal requested that it be changed, but it was Carpenter's contract that he had final cut. And when Wallace said he wouldn't change the ending, Carpenter supported him. The studio couldn't do anything about it. The idea behind making Halloween 3 something different was that they would turn the franchise into an anthology series. Every year, Carpenter and Hill would produce a new horror movie that would be set around the Halloween holiday. This way they could tell a variety of stories. Before he left the Halloween world behind, Neil even had an idea for a Halloween 4 that would have been a ghost story. The problem was, the marketing of the film didn't get this idea across at all. Anyone who didn't read magazines like Fangoria had no idea what was going on with Halloween 3. The fact that some posters included the words all new certainly didn't provide an explanation. So, moviegoers made the logical assumption that Halloween 3 was going to give them more Michael Myers action. Halloween 3 Season of the Witch reached theatres on October 22nd, 1982. It had a solid opening weekend of 6.3 million, but there are a lot of unhappy audience members. While the movie looked familiar since cinematographer Dean Cundy had returned, because Carpenter and Alan Howarth provided the score again, it was all new in a way they did not expect and did not want. It's been reported that people walked out of Halloween 3 when they realised Michael Myers wasn't going to show up. Some demanded their money back. The box office numbers plummeted. By the end of the 12-week theatrical run, the movie had only made 14.4 million, far below Halloween 2's 25 million, which was already far below the first film's box office. Wallace was left feeling he'd made a complete flop, a box office disappointment that viewers hated. But as years went by, Halloween 3 started to gain a cult following. It received reassessment from viewers who decided to give it a try on its own merits. Pushing Michael Myers out of their minds, they found that Wallace had actually made a good Halloween themed film. One that combines the roots of the holiday with modern trick or treating, that retains the cool Carpenter slash Cundy style, filtered through the sensibilities of Wallace, that has an unlikely hero, an alcoholic deadbeat who is entertaining to watch because he's played by Tom Atkins and features a brilliant performance from Dan O'Hurley. This witchcraft meets the computer age idea with something different for sure. But being different didn't mean it was bad. And for those who miss Michael Myers, there was a whole lot more of him to come. If you decide to watch Halloween 3, you should be warned that you'll be exposed to the silver shamrock jingle, which will be stuck in your head for the rest of your life. Stop it! Stop it! Wallace says there's a message to be found in the effectiveness of this earworm. In his own book about the making of Halloween 3, he said the film takes a stance against the advertising world. Against all that noise, all those jingles, all that advertising hype, 
all that pressure being exerted 24 7 on the public to buy consume want and need more and more without question he warns viewers that powerful forces are at work some merely greedy some downright evil none particularly interested in making a better world so enjoy that silver shamrock jingle but don't fall into the silver shamrock trap